The world is witnessing death and destruction in Gaza on an unprecedented scale. War crimes in full view calls for a ceasefire ignored. So why do some leaders appear more concerned with who will govern the territory once the war is over? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm James Bays. Palestinians in Gaza are leading their lives moment to moment, not sure if they'll survive Israeli attacks, if they'll be able to eat or access medical treatment for family members injured in the bombardment. In the middle of this brutal present, some world leaders have already begun discussing the future once the war is over. The US Secretary of State says there'll be no place for Hamas, nor can Israel reoccupy the Strip. That's contrary to what the Israeli Prime Minister is saying. Benjamin Netanyahu has declared Israel will be responsible for Gaza's security for an indefinite period after the war. Why do some leaders appear more concerned about who will govern Gaza once the bloodshed is over? We'll discuss this with our panel of guests in a moment. But first, this report from Paul Ging. Palestinians in Gaza have few options. If they stay in their homes, they risk being bombed. If they seek shelter in a hospital or a United Nations facility, they risk being bombed. If they leave and travel south, where the Israeli army says it's safe, they risk being bombed on the road. And if they do make it to one of the informal settlements that have sprung up in the south of the Strip, they are at risk of being bombed there too. May Allah protect us, because under these circumstances, those who want us to lead need to have the resources to do that. It's as if they've sentenced us to death. Then there's the threat of urban warfare. Israeli soldiers and Palestinian fighters are engaged in fierce battles on the streets of northern Gaza, including in Gaza City. The war shows no sign of ending, yet amid the death and destruction, some have already started to talk about the post-conflict future. I think Israel will, for uh, uh, an indefinite period, will have the overall uh, security responsibility because we've seen what happens when we don't have it. When we don't have that security responsibility, what we have is the eruption of uh, Hamas terror on a scale that we couldn't imagine. Although the U.S. Secretary of State disagreed with the Israeli Prime Minister's plan, he presented ideas of his own. No forcible displacement of Palestinians uh, from Gaza. Not now, not after the war. No use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism or other violent attacks. No reoccupation of Gaza after the conflict ends. No attempt to blockade or besiege Gaza. No reduction in the territory of Gaza. For the 2.3 million Palestinians enduring Israel's daily onslaught, what life will be like after the war is probably inconceivable right now. They have more immediate worries, somewhere safe to sleep, something to eat and drink, and whether friends and relatives are still alive. Yet the potential for further repression in the form of Israel's reoccupation of Gaza may soon be weighing heavily on already troubled minds. Paul Ging, Al Jazeera, for Inside Story. Well, let's bring in our panel of guests to discuss this more. In Houston, Texas, we have Mohammed Nablusi, an attorney and organiser with the Palestinian Youth Movement. In Haifa, the Israeli historian Ilan Pape. He's the author of the Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, a book about the Nakba or the catastrophe, the forced exodus of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948 when the State of Israel was created. And in London, we're joined by Vincent Fien, a former British Consul General in Jerusalem, a trustee of the Balfour Project. Thank you very much uh, for talking to us, uh, all of you. If I can start with you, Mohammed, yes, we are going to be talking about the future of Gaza, but I'm well aware that people on the ground in Gaza are not thinking about the future. They are living uh, moment by moment. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, as uh, I'm sure your viewers know, over the last month, we've witnessed uh, the uh, massacres of over 10,000 Palestinian uh, nearly the ma the majority of them being children. And what we've seen is the wholesale destruction of 
the civilian infrastructure of Gaza. And this is in line with uh, what we've seen from uh, the Israeli military in the past, especially in the past wars in Gaza, uh, including uh, the, the war in Lebanon in 2006, which the, the, the overall goal is to essentially devastate the civilian infrastructure and population of a specific uh, area in order to, as in their words, sear in their consciousness the Israeli response to any form of resistance to its continued occupation, occupation, siege, and imprisonment of uh, the compatriots of, of Palestinians and Lebanese. And so uh, for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip right now, it's uh, a question of how do you survive the next minute, the next hour, the next day, uh, both in terms of being able to meet their basic needs in terms of just nutrition, uh, living off of 700 calories a day, their medical needs. A lot of these people have long-standing chronic issues that are not being able to be addressed in this current moment, the lack of fuel, the lack of electricity, and the inability to find a safe space in Gaza. They're told to move south, and the south is bombardment, bombarded. I believe over the last 24 hours, the south has received more airstrikes than the actual north, where uh, the Israelis are claiming their focus or concentration in terms of Hamas's uh, military capabilities and its leadership. And so it's very clear to me that for the Palestinians in Gaza, there is no horizon beyond this war until we have uh, an implemented ceasefire, which is being called on by human rights organizations, governments across the world. Un the United Nations uh, overwhelmingly uh, voted in support of a ceasefire. And yet, both the Biden administration and this Israeli regime have failed to uh, comply with both international law and the will of the, the populations of the entire world. Ilan Pape, we are talking about the future in Gaza because key political figures are talking about it, but also because in order to make sense of what Israel is doing on the ground, we need to know what their objective is. Now, we know the objective is to destroy Hamas, but what after that? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, there is a kind of a consensus in Israel about the military, uh, if you want, aspect of what they are doing, although whether it's realistic... It's another question, and what is the huge human, unbearable and unacceptable human cost for that milit for these military decisions we can see on the ground. But you're asking me about the political decision. What would they want to do? Should they, or if they are succeeding, uh, su if they succeed in implementing their military plans? Well, uh, there is not one answer because this is goes back to the composition of the policy makers, or if you want, the government of Israel. Uh, the uh, settler components or the extreme right-wing components in the government of Israel uh, hopes that this would bring back the settlers to Gaza, uh, create uh, a, a non-Palestinian Gaza, uh, if not a, a, in over all of Gaza, then at least in the north of Gaza. Uh, Netanyahu seems to be uh, very close to that position, uh, putting huge pressure on Egypt to create uh, uh, a refugee city uh, in the Sinai uh, and kind of uh, uh, controlling the north directly uh, or even annexing it. The, the less, although in my mind they are also quite fanatic, but those who are less extreme in Israeli government and the new uh, allies of uh, Netanyahu, like Gantz, uh, uh, I mean Gantz, who joined him in the what they call the cabinet meeting, they are thinking about uh, bringing back the PA uh, to Gaza, but not to the whole of the Strip. They hope to create some sort of a buffer zone uh, that would uh, uh, be annexed to Israel, and what remains would be under the control of the Palestinian uh, uh, Authority. Uh, again, I, I don't think anybody there has worked out a detailed plan. Uh, these are more kinds of visions uh, driven by their ideologies, uh, but all of them are uh, meant to, what they think, is to change dramatically uh, the nature of who rules Gaza and how much of Gaza remains in the hands of Israelis and how much of it will be an autonomous uh, Palestinian area, very much like Area A or B uh, in the West Bank. 
OK, let me bring in Vincent. And before I ask you a question, Vincent, um, let's just explain to our viewers, you're the retired British Consul General. Now, the UK, like many other countries, has an ambassador in Tel Aviv who deals with Israel and a Consul General in Jerusalem who deals with the Palestinians. You're also, you're also the trustee of the Balfour Project. Perhaps you could quickly explain what that is uh, and then answer my question. Um, when, having heard what Ilan has said, about the disagreements at the highest level in Israel on what is the final plan here. If there isn't a clear plan, isn't that how military missions end up in a quagmire? Yes, thank you. Um, a brief word about the Balfour Project. We have a, a website, www.balfourproject.org. On that website, there is a film called Britain in Palestine, 1917-48. to 48. We have to remember, and Ilan knows it better than I, uh, the promises made by Britain, the Balfour Declaration, and then the conduct of the mandate, contradictory promises by the British government, leaving a mess in 1948. So as Guterres said, the UN Secretary General said a few days ago, uh, there is a, this, this conflict has not emerged in a vacuum. There is a context. And I would commend to your viewers the objectivity of that film. It's important when there's so much deliberate disinformation going around. There is a UK responsibility uh, and a UK responsibility to give a lead in the direction of equality. Now, turning to your question, um, there is uh, obscurity about um, the intentions of the, of the government of Israel. And if I try to compare what they are saying to what uh, Tony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, is saying on his tour of um, Arab capitals and Ankara, um, there is a contradiction there. Um, Biden and Blinken are talking about um, no occupation of Gaza after this war. The reality is that Israel has never ceased to occupy Gaza since 1967. It also occupies East Jerusalem and the rest of the West Bank. And we mustn't forget the difficulties being ex experienced by uh, Palestinians in the West Bank, over 2,000 being displaced by violent settlers, probably with the silence or connivance of the, of the Israeli army. But coming back to your question, um, and, and just saying one point about the Palestinian Authority. Um, Western governments have been liaising for 20, 30 years with the PLO, which excludes uh, Hamas and excludes Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So the port of call for Blinken on his tour has been, uh, been Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. And the efforts of the West, of uh, Blinken, Sunak, Macron and others, will be to listen to Ramallah, rightly or wrongly, but to listen to Ramallah. And my last point for now would be to say what we need in this turmoil is Palestinian agency. So I would be very inclined to listen to Mohammed uh, more than to me, Palestinian agency leading to self-determination for the Palestinian people alongside Israel, because in my opinion, Israel is there to stay. OK, well, let's, ju let's examine some of the things that people are saying on this right now. Uh, we heard in our opening report the comments of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Let me pull it up on the screen and let's just examine that again. The Israeli Prime Minister says, I think Israel, for an indefinite period, will have the overall security responsibility because we've seen what happens when they don't have that security responsibility. Mohammed, when you hear those words, does, do you think that means... Israeli troops will continue for a very long time on the ground in Gaza. Is that your reading of it? I don't believe that Netanyahu or the Israeli administration and its, and it, and its co current coalition knows what that means itself. Uh, and the reason being is ultimately the decision is not going to revolve around their own independent calculation of what they should do, but depend on the way the actual Palestinian resistance in Gaza responds. Are they going to be able to withstand a continued military occupation with boots on the ground in the Gaza Strip, given the tunnel systems, given the capabilities, given the threat and the risks involved in the north with uh, the resistance in Lebanon? Uh, given the regional dynamics and the pressures that they're going to face from both the 
countries they seek to normalize with and various actors they have trade, trade deals with, like Turkey and uh, uh, elsewhere. And so I don't believe that the, the government uh, currently has an exit strategy or even a post, uh, so to speak, war strategy, because I don't think this war will end. I think it will be a continuation of the 75 years that we already have experienced. It will be just a variation or a rearrangement of that military structure, that military rule over Palestinian life, and there will be continued resistance to it. Hamas is, uh, uh, whether Israel likes it or not, is there to stay, whether in an organized political formation or through the actions of an underground guerrilla movement in the Gaza Strip. And that's the same that can be said of the West Bank. We've seen an increase both in terms of the involvement of non sort of Hamas or Islamic Jihad groups, groups that are working under broader banners and umbrellas, groups that are uh, drawing on various factions. We've also seen the military wing of Fatih, uh, the, uh, um, uh, 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 the Al-Aqsa brigades who have entered the fray and have been confronting uh, Israel for the last multiple years. And so uh, for me, the, the, the stated goals of the Israeli government right now are simply cover for their implementation of the Dahiya doctrine, which is something that they established in 2006 with, with uh, the resistance in Lebanon, was that we will target civilian infrastructure and population as a deterrence equation, as a message to not just the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, but the Arab and Islamic world as a whole, that should there ever be any confrontation with our plans or occupation of the region, we will uh, the civilian populations of your territories will be met with extreme force. And let so, me let me let um, me bring in Ilan on, on some Im of the things that you've said there. Um, you said that you're never going to get rid of Hamas, however many operatives or leaders you kill. The ideas, the ideology of resistance is embedded in Gaza. Ilan, do you think Israel is not learning the lessons of history if they think there's going to be a more compliant Palestinian um, population after this very brutal? Bombardment. Well, I, I agree with Muhammad. I, I, I think that, uh, first of all, as horrific uh, uh, as the situation is now, and I'm afraid it can be even worse, uh, uh, it's not a, a game changer in, in any way. Uh, uh, Palestine would still be colonized, the West Bank would still be uh, occupied, the Gaza Strip would still be uh, sieged and the Palestinian resistance uh, uh, would continue. In, in that respect, it, it's absolutely a good analysis in the sense that uh, uh, the, what we see here uh, is not uh, an act that is meant to change the reality, but rather to maintain it. Uh, and uh, if, if I'm right that this is uh, uh, what is going on, and this is probably what uh, will unfold, then yes, the answer to your question is no, is that they are not learning uh, from history. Uh, they do believe that uh, whatever they have done in the last uh, 56 years since 1967 is more or less working. You would have thought that the uh, uh, operation of the Hamas on the morning of the 7th of October would uh, send uh, a, a kind of waves of doubt uh, among the policy makers or the military commanders of, of Israel by saying, are you sure it's working given what happened on the 7th of October? But immediately they created a, a narrative that says uh, what happened is something the world would understand belongs to the history of, of Nazism or ISIS and so on. Uh, and, and therefore they, they, can't, they, they don't want to digest uh, what they should digest or learn the lesson that they should learn. So I'm afraid that we will be uh, at the same point that we are, uh, that we are here at now. Namely, you have Western governments providing immunity to Israel con con to continue these uh, policies of oppression, uh, civil societies who stand behind the Palestinian uh, struggle, a military imbalance that does not allow the Palestinians any uh, future uh, or even a hope of, of liberating uh, Palestine at this moment in history. But that also means cycles and cycles of bloodshed and violence, unless uh, the whole uh, perspective of the region and the international community would change, because the imbalance of the, uh, on the ground 
locally would stay the same. The OK, let me, let, me, let me bring in Vincent. Let yeah. me bring in Vincent. You mentioned the views of the international community. We're beginning to get some of the views of certainly the US. Let me go back to what we heard at the top of the programme, the comment from Anthony Blinken. Again, let me put it up on the screen. No forcible displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. Not now, not after the war. No use of Gaza as a platform for terrorism. No reoccupation of Gaza. So there, from the US Secretary of State, some red lines for the US... Uh, from the US for Israel. Uh, do you think Israel will listen? Do you think even the President of the United States, when he hasn't been able to get a humanitarian pause he's been asking for, for days and days, has any sway over Prime Minister Netanyahu? There is a problem, and the problem uh, lies in large part with the government of Israel in that the current coalition, pre gantz if you like, um, has as its policy platform that all the land belongs to Israel, and it's for Israel to choose. Now, that deprives the Palestinian people of the right to self-determination, which is a right, not a gift, it's their right. And the international community must not and should not um, connive at the perpetuation of the occupation, the occupation of 1967. As I said, there's a context which goes back to 48 and before, but in terms of what the Western powers, um, Blinken, Macron, etc., can do, with Britain taking a, a leading role because of its responsibilities, its historic responsibilities, is to say to Israel, it is not possible for you to maintain that you have control and that you have sovereignty over the entirety of uh, what was British Mandate Palestine. It cannot be. That policy has to change. And I do believe that in civil society, in Parliament, in the UK, and one would hope in government, there is a realisation that that Israeli government policy must change and that in Britain, particularly where I am, the mindset of the government needs to be parity of esteem between Palestinians and Israelis. Because the other part of what Mr Blinken is saying is that he wants the Palestinian Authority to take control of Gaza. He wants it, he says, unified with the West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. So for you, Mohammed, do you think the Palestinian Authority would like to resume control of Gaza in this way? And what would people of Gaza make of a return of the Palestinian Authority? Well, from the stated... Uh... The statements of Mahmoud Abbas um, regarding this, it seems like he's in favor and through his consultations with Blinken on assuming authority of the, the Gaza Strip. But you have to remember that the, the Palestinian Authority is deeply unpopular, viewed as illegitimate, increasingly so, including as a result of their response to um, the genocidal campaign being waged on the Gaza Strip. Uh, it's unpopular amongst its own base, its own supporters, uh, are increasingly seeing it as delegitimate and acting outside of its scope of authority, including actual members of the security forces that are tasked with uh, maintaining uh, or preventing any resistance to the Israeli occupation. And in the Gaza Strip specifically, if the Palestinian Authority rides in on, is, on an Israeli, on a proverbial Israeli tank, that's going to be met uh, and viewed as a continuation of the Israeli campaign on the Gaza Strip in its current form. And even then, as has been mentioned by, by my colleagues, uh, the coalition in its current form is deeply ant uh, antagonistic to the role of the Palestinian Authority, especially the far-right uh, parties, the ones who are uh, interested mostly in settlement expansion in the West Bank and prioritizing their, their abilities to do so. And so there's not going to be a situation where they're even supported by the Israeli government, regardless of what the international community wants. And okay, at the end let of the me, day, let, the let, Palestinian... let, me, let me bring in Ilan now, because there is another idea floating around, which is to make Gaza either a trusteeship or have some sort of UN force. Worth explaining to our viewers, the UN have been involved in the past. Um, you have UNDOF, the UN...
disengagement observer force that's up in the Golan Heights uh, there since the 1973 uh, war. You also have a separate force, UNIFIL, the UN interim force in Lebanon. The interim in that name, in fact, has already lasted 45 years. Um, they've been there since the Israeli army pulled out of southern Lebanon. But, Ilan, it would be very different, wouldn't it, for, for UN countries, UN member states, to come up with a force here because they would not be working as a peacekeeping force. They'd actually be working, it seems, as, as, the, as the prison wardens in the prison that is Gaza. Yes, they would be asked to, to do what the PA is being, uh, was asked to do by Israel, subcontract uh, the, what the Israeli call the security uh, of Israel. No, I don't think it's going to work. I, I mean, we can just go back in history to the attempt of uh, the United Nations and the international community to act as a buffer zone in the city of Hebron, Khalil, uh, between the fanatic settlers there and the uh, uh, the, the people of, of Hebron, and we know what happened. I mean, they, they were totally ignored, and, and uh, half of the city was ethnically uh, cleansed. Either we continue what we had, and as we said before, this means colonization and anti-colonial struggle, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to predict how it will uh, unfold exactly, apart from the fact that it would cost many human lives. Or the other trajectory is to change the diskette altogether. And, and, and say we need a different approach to all of it. This is not about how Israel should control parts of Palestine. This is how Palestine should look like uh, if we are serious about self-determination, uh, liberation, freedom, return of refugees. Uh, the Palestinians don't have the power to impose that kind of conversation, but the region has, the Islamic world has, and the world has. It's just a matter of regional international determination uh, uh, to try and take responsibility. And I, I agree with Vincent, Britain should be the first one to do it. But Britain is not the only uh, international actor responsible for uh, the immunity that Israel enjoys in its oppression of the Palestinian. There are many, many other culprits in this. And the world has to change its attitude and at least go back to the kind of uh, uh, mentality if you, if, if you want or perception of the of the uh situation as it adopted towards apartheid south africa that would be a very good beginning it, it doesn't solve immediately the problems of gaza and so on but at least uh we should try and exploit this horrific uh genocidal situation into uh, a different kind of trajectory that takes us into a future where such uh, uh, crimes against humanity are not perpetrated uh, anymore, uh, which is, by the way, a win-win situation for everyone, uh, but one that uh, Israel, uh, uh, of course, doesn't wish uh, to unfold, and one that, unfortunately, most of the Israeli Jews uh, 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 support the government on this. So there are situations in history where you cannot rely on the change of within from, in, from within the colonizers' society. You need region, the region and the international community to interfere and understand that this is not just a local issue of injustice. It has huge implications for the region as a whole and I would say to many parts of the world as well. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for joining us for this discussion. I think uh, we've all learned something uh, while listening to this programme. Thank you to our guests, Mohamed Nablusi, Ilan Pape and Vincent Fien. Round-the-clock coverage of the war in Gaza continues on Al Jazeera. For more detailed context and analysis, you can go to our website, aljazeera.com. If you have any comments, suggestions and, yes, even complaints, Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or you could tweet at us at what used to be Twitter and now is called X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, James Bays, and all the team here, stay safe. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>